Hello folks, I'm Grimwick from NatchyEvil.com, and this is Natchian News. While reading off the new episode of Whirlson, I suddenly came to realize that I suck at female voices. What with my lovely baritone voice and verbal typos. So I've invited Evil Seedlit from the last episode along for this mad, mad ride whenever I need a female voice. Yes, yes, there was no Natch Evil comic last week. But, that's because I was building a backlog. Stop throwing bricks at me. The regular three times a week update will continue starting today. Our special guest is Azrael, aka Mr. Michaud. He comes from a land where everything is strange and poisonous, Australia. So he'll make a fine addition to Whirlsin Gate, I feel. Also, here's a picture of a quokka. All right, sit back, relax, and enjoy the newest installment of the show. Whirlsend Gate, Episode 4, Everyone Remembers Their First Time, by Mike Rojas. Guest voice by Azrael and Evil Seedlet. November, 1921, Blue Crow Avenue. A brothel in the town of Whirlsend is an absurdity. Sex is one of the four sins of Whirlsend, and was, to a degree, forbidden. Madame Lissa didn't see it that way. Her insane optimism and endeavorous appeal won over the minds of the town when she purchased the former Academy for Strange Children. They cheered when she knocked the whole bottom floor out to make way for a stage, a huge table space, and a bar under the stairs. Then she garbed it in red carpets thick enough to soak up pipe and cigar smoke and made it unlike anything Wilson had seen before. It was normal. Two years ago, when prohibition was enacted and adopted officially by Knox's state law, the FBI tried to shut down the Red House. Their bodies, and the bodies of those looking for them, never surfaced. The FBI simply wrote off Madame Lissa and Knox's State Bureau of Law Enforcement, the NSBLE, learned long ago to leave Whirlson Gate alone. The power of Madame Lissa, you see, was her detailed understanding of sin and where the lines were drawn. If strong men with fine minds and big guns could not threaten her establishment, what could? A farm boy holding fifty dollars. You have to understand, back in 1921, fifty dollars could buy you a fine fur-lined coat with enough left over to feed the family for a couple of days. It was one-eighth a new car. Fifty dollars was nothing to blink at. And she didn't. She stood there with two twenties and five twos in her hand, turning it over in her mind. So, am I presenting the device or what? asked Felix Gregerson at the tables. Not now, Felix, said Lissa, keeping her attention on the boy. Her usual bubbling demeanor was crushed under the treads of logic rolling in her head. When everything finally fell into place, she smiled. All right, kid, she said, giving in. You got yourself one night, but that's it. You understand? This is a one-time only deal. Y yes ma'am, the boy said. The left side of his lip was cleft, but his speech was imposed by nervousness only. Girls. When the madam called, the showgirls trailed off the stage and passed the audience to the bar. One of the patrons, a man the size of a truck, pinched the girl on the ass as she passed by. Big Jim. None of that now. Where are the other two? The two bartenders, also girls, joined the line in front of Lissa and the boy. All right, kid. Pick your favorite. It wasn't an easy choice. They were all beauties. Golden hair curling down their shoulders under their peacock costumes of red and purple. Except for the two barmaids who wore vests and bow ties. They all had the same ruby lips, button nose, gray eyes. Hang on. The farm boy twisted his already twisted lip. They were all twins? Nothing slips past you, darling. Madame Lissa smirked. Now, who'll it be? Uh, 
I don't know, ma'am. That one, I guess. Madame Lissa spoke as she pulled behind the farm boy. Lillian, if you please. One of the identical showgirls stepped forward, her face scrunched in confusion. Uh, Miss Lissa, shouldn't I? The full treatment, Lillian. The full? Lissa winked at the girl. The full treatment. Right. The dancer heaved a sigh and smiled at the boy. The full treatment, then. She took his shivering hand and led the soon-to-be man upstairs. Is that wise? Asked Felix, nursing his gin and tonic. Oh, it'll be fine. Speaking of which... Lissa whispered something to one of the bartenders. The twin's smile grew larger than humanly possible, and she snuck upstairs afterwards. The other bar girl stepped behind the counter and went back to work as Lissa led the three remaining twins backstage. What's wrong, Felix? Asked Big Jim, with his unnaturally high-pitched voice. Think about it, Jim. A farm boy shows up to a brothel with more money than he should have. What do you think it's for? Well, it looked under level to me. Yes, but this is Whirlsend. What's that sin that may call on the particular beast that could rape this house and everyone in it? Uh, don't have sex? Big Jim thought about it for half a second. We should go. Felix agreed. Just before they left, Felix heard a heavy rolling from behind the curtains on stage. Madame Lissa stepped on stage in front of her patrons. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid with just three girls left, we couldn't possibly have a proper show for you tonight. But fear not, fellas, we got something. A stimulation of the highest senses for a change. Mr. Gregerson. A spotlight flicked on and pointed at the two at the door. Madam Lissa, I have to leave, protested Felix, his missing eyes still able and expressive. Have some priority. Nonsense, Mr. Gregerson. The good people of Whirlsend would be highly fascinated by your contraption. Felix narrowed his eye sockets. Won't you come up on stage, sir? Yeah! yelled Jebediah, a cow skull faced man in a blue jacket, sitting at the front table. Uh, Felix? Jim said, looking out the front door. Even I can tell this is dumb. No, said Felix, patting Jim on one of his extraordinary arms. Stick around, Jim. I may need you. Huh? She's up to something. Felix walked towards the stage as Lissa walked to the bar opposite. When they passed, Lissa slipped him a note. He stopped just before climbing in front of the audience to read the small paper, then turned around to gawk at the madam. On to stage he went. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever wondered as to the nature of the children or the substance of ghostly element in this cursed town? No? Well, I'm going to educate you anyway on the hidden elements of the aether and the ectoplasm. Felix looked behind the red curtain and pulled out a manuscript, then again addressed the patrons. Since the end of World War I a few years ago, the Austrian government had to nix a few projects but here... He raised the manuscript for emphasis. Here, ladies and gentlemen, found in the Volchapain Memorial Library is a document outlining research in the subject of Aether. Aether, yes, Aether! That strange element that lay between us, the moon, the sun, and the stars. Well, I've learnt its secrets. With my degree in linguistics and occult sciences, it was a small leap from understanding their language to understanding the principles of the afterlife itself. Indeed, with this research, we may even be able to learn the nature and origin of the children that stalk each and every one of us. Am I right? There were murmurs and awes coming from the crowd. I ask, am I right? Cheers burst forth from the audience. Then draw the curtains. Behind Felix, as the red curtains pulled back, appeared a mechanical and cryptic machine made of silver, white, and blue. Strange pistons poised ready to pump liquid something into the tank next to that gasket, next to that Jacob's ladder, next to that perforated cylinder. At the top of the device, a full head above Felix's small stature, was a chrome globe the size of a human skull jammed roughly onto a pipe, jammed into a box with dials, jammed into the machine. Behold, friends! Behold! Felix presented the giant thing. The Gregerson device. 
<laughs> the man cackled at the hushed silence produced by the patrons. Two men, leaning out from their booth, fell on the floor with surprise. Utilizing my great knowledge of occult mechanical engineering, I have constructed a device that will show you nothing less than the Aether itself. It lays not out above the air we breathe, but in it, ladies and gentlemen. All around us, we swim in the stuff, but we are not alone. No, sir. Reality fills the stuff of space with vague monsters, as you'll soon see. Even Big Jim was impressed by the absurdity of Felix's claim, but he too stood fixated on the device. That is, until he heard the two thumps from the floor above him. Then Lissa made a wave at Felix over and above the crowd. Felix laughed. <laughs> if you have weak hearts or are prone to nightmares, I'm afraid it's too late, because this, my friends, is the Aether. He threw a huge switch in the side of the machine. It made the noise of a screaming car submerged in hot butter mixed with an electric dolphin squeaking. Lightning flashed off the Jacob's Ladder, and the globe at the top buzzed louder and louder until... The farm boy wiped his brow. Okay, Tommy, this is it. Daddy said you gotta be a man, and you're gonna be a man. The whole room was a soft pink on red decor. The bed looked plush and richer than anything Tom had seen in his hard-working life. Despite how beautiful the room was, it was nothing compared to Lillian. She slipped easily out of her peacock costume and headdress. Tommy felt his hands clench nervously. Don't worry, honey. Lillian soothed. I'll take good care of you. Just relax and take off your clothes. Tommy was suddenly aware that his knees were failing. <laughs> You're cute, you know that? The boy didn't argue. He pulled off his suspenders and flannel shirt. I ain't done this before, ma'am. Please, call me Lillian. And don't worry. Here, let me help you. By this point, Lillian herself was naked. And even though she felt crummy after just getting out from under those sweaty spotlights, she looked no less like an angel in Tommy's eyes. There. Tommy shook in nothing but his boxers while Lillian reclined under the bed. Even if Tommy hadn't been distracted by the lovely woman in front of him, he probably still wouldn't have noticed the eyeball peeping through the keyhole behind him. As Tommy approached the bed, the bartender outside stamped on the hallway floor twice. Tommy didn't hear it as he slowly stepped towards Lillian. I'll be easy for you, said Lillian, reaching a hand out. Just come to me. So close. He was so very close, with fingertips reaching to the angel before him. Then... Tommy heard a buzzing whine. The sound didn't alarm him as much as the sight before him. Lillian never took her eyes off the boy, but he came to realize there were things in the air between him and the woman. Cylindric creatures five segmented feet in length with ten belt-like wings slid past and through him. There were globs of misshapen mouths flying with tendrils flicking like squid that devoured each other. At one point, a balloon fish with a single two-lobed eye swam through Lillian and into Tommy's body. He screamed, and he fell to the floor, clawing at his naked chest. Burbling wax glued upwards, a reverse drip, and human teeth stepped sideways, bumping into his face. As he pushed himself back against the door, a multi-eared hairless rodent with glorp-like fins sung, all twelve and a half eyes following the boy's tongue. Whiskers with meat, bubbles of warts, mushing finger protrusions, screaming, screaming, screaming. Felix turned off the device. So you see, I am closer to understanding these children than anyone else, and I think you'll find... what the... F 
Felix was cut off by screaming and the sound of the farm boy thumping downstairs. The audience craned their necks and watched the half-naked Tommy, in blind terror, crash into Big Jim and spin out the door. The sound of a car screeching to a halt was heard. Most people shrugged. Another martini, Madam Lissa? asked the bartender. Sure. Lissa slid fifty dollars across the bar. I'm good for it. If you like Whirlson Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will bring me that much closer to purchasing my own forbidden island to fill with beautiful goth girls in bikinis. There I will live out the rest of my life in weird, black, tropical, and gothic adventure nastiness. <laughs> oh, and uh, I'll, I'll bring along my wife, too. Music for World Sin Gate and Natchian News was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. You can find a link to his website in the description. Many thanks to Azriel for finding that website, by the way. Uh, Seedlit did too, but Azriel got it to me first. I needed good music for this YouTube podcast thing. Today's noun was the brothel. Leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next episode, forming a chain of nouns. If you'd like to hear more of Evil Seedlet's voice, she has her own YouTube channel. You can find a link for that in the description as well. Want to help? Want to do a voice? Want to send an idle threat? My email is natchevil at gmail.com. Have nothing but fun, YouTubes. Have nothing but fun. What's wrong, Felix? Mm. Oh my god! I hate this voice! We gotta do something about this voice! I've never taken... <laughs> I've never taken drugs before. I've never taken drugs. Ooh, that's a good voice right there. I like that. We're gonna try this one. It's a bit... It's a deep man trying to imitate a little girl. <clears throat> Pardon me. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with me? Ooh. What's wrong, Felix?